Happy Easter, guys. It is not Easter Sunday, it's Neo Sunday. Uh, what a sacrilegious gathering uh, we have here. A huge welcome here from, from Hong Kong. Uh, good morning to most of you. As I know, most of you are either in North America or in Europe. So thank you very much for, for joining me here. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces on here. Um, PG, um, Robert, Jeff, Howard. Fantastic to have you on here. Greek Orthodox Easter, Easter is indeed uh, about a month later. You, uh, thank you there, Howard, for sharing that. P Jam thinks this is clickbait, uh, yet you tuned in. Well, and I'm going to show you why there are facts behind uh, what you deem to be clickbait. I didn't make that number up. Uh, I actually did a fairly thorough analysis, and I'm going to show you exactly why and how. Shyam, a uh, big welcome to this chat. Now, as always, guys, uh, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only. Always bear that in mind uh, before we proceed, so to speak. And also, most importantly, more important than anything, really, are the goats. <laughs> if you don't know why there are goats on my screen, uh, I donate one cent for every one of your likes to the goats. And we are now up to, uh, what is it? I just posted in the discords. I think we are up to 620, 600. 94 US dollars so far we have donated to animal sanctuaries. Thanks for your likes, to your likes. So all you have to do is hit the like button, I'll donate one cent and I'll keep doing that. So thank you very much for your support here. I, I posted on our Patreon, we have a tracker there. You can see my receipts and everything. Everything is as transparent as it could possibly be. Now, what are we going to talk about first? Well, I think we should probably kick off with what my headline is, and that is Neo to $92 this year. And I'm going to show you uh, my uh, my uh, discounted cash flow model here. Um, uh, happy Easter also there to New York, to Sweden. Uh, I'm glad you guys are all tuning in. Uh, fantastic to have you on the call here. So this 10-year uh, discounted cash flow model I put out today over on our Patreon, if you want to get that, links below. And let me pull it up. This is what I've got. Um, and I'm going to walk you through it because there are quite a few steps to it. And actually, I think even if you are not invested in NEO, understanding sort of the basics of how these growth companies are valued is super, super important, I think, for anyone investing in anything with growth, quite frankly. And I think that's probably most of us. So obviously, headline figure here, 92, 20, 21, and some people might then just turn around and walk away. Um, I would think that's a mistake. I think it is better to understand how I got there and how also analysts uh, might get there. Um, Alexander, a big welcome from uh, India there. Uh, videos you want me to look at Pfizer, we can do that. Um, and VA Beach, uh, Felix Finance. Yes, we have become Felix and Friends. I kind of think it's a more inclusive uh, title as we are really a community here uh, sharing lots of research uh, and kind of building themes and portfolios together. Um, so let's look at what we've got here. Okay, I'm going to explain this and it's going to take a couple of minutes. So just bear with me. If you've got questions, shout them out. That's sort of the whole point of this, really. Uh, this here is, this line I'm highlighting here is the easiest one. Uh, that is revenue, excluding autonomous driving revenue. So it's essentially car revenue because I'm not really including the neo life and things like that. And for this year, I've got that at 40 billion, uh, that is B. Um, and that is the equivalent of about 100,000, just over 100,000 cars sold. Um, and then for next year, I'm, gr I'm growing fairly aggressively here until 2025, when we get up to about 1.2 million cars sold. After that, my growth, as you can see here, flattens off massively, and I'll explain why, and I'll also show you uh, what we might do about that. But with this number, you essentially get eventually to about 1.6 million cars sold per annum at the end of the 10-year period. Why 10 years? It's a standard thing the industry analysts look at. We basically look 10 years forward, we look at the revenue, we look at the margin, and then we discount it back to present value. EBITDA is basically profit, right? Um, so the profit margin I've got is, um, is basically 15% um, and that is based on what, you might wonder? Uh, well, it's based on Tesla. Tesla at the moment is at 15%. Um, I think Tesla's going to go up, uh, and I think NEO might well exceed it, but at the moment, let's just stick with 15% as a fairly conservative number. Uh, so that is based on 
the car sales revenue. That's 15% of the car sales revenue because I have an extra column here, uh, which is in, in the yellow part here. And the first row is my autonomous driving revenue. And William Lee's told us uh, he's basically going to charge people 800 RMB. Uh, that's just over 100 US dollars uh, per month for autonomous driving as a subscription. So that's 9,600 RMB per year. I hope you're with me so far. If not, um, do, do ask. I will answer uh, everything uh, that you are shouting out here. So what am I doing? I'm starting autonomous driving in 2023. On what basis, you might wonder? Well, we know that at the end of this year, 2021, the trucks that Neo Capital are invested in are going into mass production with level three autonomous driving. Um, so therefore, I'm assuming that by 2023, we'll be well into level three, level four-ish autonomous driving, at which point you can really charge people proper subscription revenue ab uh, above the, what the Neo Pilot subscription is at the moment. Uh, and then I'm taking um, the cars here of the last three years that will basically all pay that. And then we go forward. When we go to 2023, sorry, 20, 2030, difficult number to say, it's the future. I am now only taking the last seven years worth of cars sold as paying for subscription revenue. Why? Because who's going to want to drive around in, a, in an electric vehicle that's more than seven years old? Quite frankly, the technology will be outdated. It's a bit like having a seven-year-old phone or a seven-year-old laptop. Very few people use them. Uh, so that's kind of what I put in here, also my assumption. Uh, so therefore... Um, it, it, you know, the numbers don't, incre don't increase forever, if, if you know what I mean. They sort of slow down a little bit here. Uh, and that gives us an autonomous driving revenue here of that 91,201, multiply that by millions. What's my margin on that? And that's really the big, big value differentiator here with what we are all excited about. If you're investing in EVs, you're not investing in cars. No, 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 no. You're investing in subscription revenue from autonomous driving. That is a huge chunk of your valuation. And I'm assuming here a 50% EBITDA margin. And what am I basing that on? Well, I had a look at Microsoft. Microsoft's margin is at 46.8%. Um, and I must say, I absolutely love the Microsoft stock. I mean, nothing compounds quite like it. There are some others, but it's a fantastic business. It's a subscription business. It's absolutely beautiful, dominating the space. Amazon, um, AWS, the cloud business, it has a 50% or thereabouts a bit margin. So I think for subscription businesses, a 50% margin is relatively reasonable. So that's what I'm using. But then you're wondering, well, how do you get that back into the EBITDA up here? So what I've done rather crudely is I have a proper calculation below and then I'm simply adding, and let me just delete that for you. And then you can see, so whoops, this, this 99,000 is the EBITDA, so the profit without subscription revenue. So, so, so subscription profit, I should say. So all I'm doing is I'm adding to that up here the profit, right? And I've done that already for all the years where it's relevant. And that's what gets me up quite substantially. If I take that out, you see we're at about $70, $75. And I put it back in, uh, you can see that's a, that's a pretty big jump. It's sort of a good $20 there uh, from autonomous driving. So that gets, gets me to this figure. Now, you might say that I'm rather conservative on several fronts. Um, my EBITDA margin are based, as I say, on Tesla's margin. A BMW, for example, has a 13% EBITDA margin. I've written that in the notes up here uh, in the, the little highlighted bit here. Now, EVs are much cheaper to manufacture in the long run. Uh, Gary here, big welcome to you. Thanks for joining. I am deep diving into the numbers, I'm afraid. Yes, you'll have to bear with me, but do ask questions because I think it's, it's interesting. And Lily, robo-taxis, we're going to get to that also. Well, I think it's interesting. I hope you find it interesting too. If not, shout and uh, let me know and I'll go do something else. Uh, but I think sometimes it's good to really dive into the numbers and really understand what's going on here. So BMW, who are a competitor in terms of price point and the kind of cars offered, their margin is 13%, which is fairly good for a car manufacturer. Now, Making an ICE has many, many, many more parts than an EV because it's just simpler, right? The whole process is just much, much simpler. At the moment, EVs are expensive to make because the batteries are so expensive and we haven't got the scale, right? You know, Neo is making 7,000 cars a month. Uh, once they make 70,000 cars a month, maybe they don't quite get there, uh, but actually they will eventually. Um, 
your whole uh, scale issue is much, much better. And also batteries will eventually become cheap. There'll be a glut of batteries and there'll be a glut of chips and uh, the technology will keep advancing and the cars will, will no longer have to use the absolute latest in chip and battery technology because people will be very content to have uh, an EV that drives a thousand miles. Do you need it to go 3000 miles far? Probably not. So there will be that, that point uh, that will happen at some point. And so therefore you could think, okay, let's say that we make the margins a little bit better, right? So, so let's say we make it, um, a lot of analysts for Tesla have it going to about 18.9%. So can you see where I'm changing that here? So I'm putting that into the last year. So what's the difference up here? Let me do it on a calculator. That's basically 102 minus, what was it before? 92, All right? So that's $10. So I'm gonna write in here $10. So that's that's potential, I'll make that a dollar, for if we make the margin 18.9% um, margin. Uh, on car sales, that is. So if we did that, not just for the last year, for 2030, but say we also do it for 2029, it gives you an extra dollar. Okay, I'm going to forget the extra dollar for now. I'm going to ignore that. But I want to kind of illustrate to you how you can look at these models and come up with a fair, fair value. Um, the next item is that I model, obviously, very, very little car sales growth after 2026. Um, why? Because I'm sort of thinking there is a point where um, it'll be difficult to sell more cars per year. Look at BMW, they have negative growth uh, at the moment, or they're sort of flatline plus a couple of percent. They don't really uh, sell a lot more year on year. Um, you could change that. How? Well, you could introduce uh, this here, which Robert calls a mini what do you call it? A minivan, Robert, which is rather offensive to this uh, it majestic vehicle. This is a Toyota Alphard. It costs 120,000 US dollars and more than 100,000 of those are sold in mainland China a year. Um, they are luxury uh, people carriers, seven seaters, uh, very luxurious and Neo is going into that space. So they could do that. Uh, I think they could also launch a smaller kind of BMW 3 series. They could launch a sort of BMW 1 series launch a sort of BMW Mini. I'm rather BMW obsessed today, aren't I? But you know, there are options if they kind of branch out into smaller cars and into a more diverse uh, car platform, you could then say, well, okay, maybe they won't grow at, um, you know, 5% here. Let's just keep, keep that going at say 10%. So I'm just making that 10% here. Ah, that's 12% extra, $12 extra. So 10% um, uh, growth uh, that is 20, uh, 20, 26 and following years, right? Um, so that then becomes, and, and we're going to add this all up and we're sort of going to come to a bullish scenario uh, versus a, um, a cautious scenario. So I'm going to put my 5% back in here uh, just so we have our base case. Um, the next issue is subscription revenue. So I'm just sticking here to that 800 RMB a month, uh, which is, um, what is that in US dollars? 800 times 0 0.15, 120 US dollars per month. You could imagine you could introduce a more premium subscription service, perhaps for the latest features, uh, or perhaps to include certain parts of the country. You could charge a little bit more in Shanghai than you would in perhaps rural areas. There's sort of tier pricing you could do. Um, and I think there are also opportunities for streaming services, other services that you're providing essentially in the now computer screens that you're going to have in there, uh, exceptionally fast Wi-Fi perhaps, or you know other things that you could make money out of. You could charge software companies to access your operating system. Uh, so if somebody wants to use Microsoft 365 in there, you could charge Microsoft an access fee. You know, you, you, might, you might be able to do things like that. That'll add a little bit here. I'm not going to throw in a huge amount here extra, but you could see why you could say you ramp your margin up in the last year by just to 55% rather than 5%. Okay, that only gets you an extra dollar or two. So we're not going to write that down. Um, now, a bigger item is my terminal EBITDA multiple. And you're thinking, terminal, what? Is he dying? No. Uh, what it means is that the multiplier of enterprise value uh, compared to the actual profit EBITDA, earnings before interest and tax deductibles, etc. cetera. Um, I'm using here 10.5x. I've highlighted, highlighted that here where I'm moving my lovely mouse. 
And I hope you are uh, still with me, uh, Jordi. I know it's a bit of a monologue, it's a bit of a lecture, and I apologize for that. But I kind of think it's un interesting to understand how these things work, because this is the kind of model precisely uh, that analysts use. And that's why I come up with similar numbers to most analysts also. Um, so I have 10.5x here. Now, the Nasdaq's last 12 months um, enterprise value divided by EBITDA is 17.9. So Shall we throw in 17.9? We can do that. I'm writing it down here uh, in cell F222. So you have to scroll down it past all of these scary numbers and change this one here. I've highlighted it to make it easier to find. So I'm going to make this 17.9. And then what happens there to the stock? Well, it says drink, drink some water. It also says if this is a subscribe button, guys. This is my rather low-tech effort of a subscribe button. Uh, so I would really truly appreciate if you joined the community. Okay, so we have 128 then, um, minus 92. That is $36. That's pretty substantial. So that is um, <clears throat> basically if we do a 17.9x uh, multiple. I put a comma in there. I don't know why, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, then that gives us an extra $36. So that would be a little bit more of a, a, a slightly more bullish case rather than my uh, more modest case. I'm basically pricing NEO here below uh, what the um, what we were we at before. We were at 10.5, right? I'm going to change it back uh, down here. Uh, I'm pricing it below what the present NASDAQ average is. Now, the NASDAQ is at a fairly high level at the moment. So again, I'm being a bit conservative. Um, the other thing, which was what, what Lily shouted out here, uh, very truly and correctly, is no robo taxi revenue in there. Um, will Neo run a massive robo taxi fleet? Um, I think they will run a robo taxi, more like a car sharing. And I see that from uh, from the more kind of luxury, uh, what is currently sort of an Uber um, X kind of type. Is it X XL? I can't remember. That's how long I haven't used an Uber because I haven't gone anywhere in a year. Um, you know, the more premium, Uber Black, I think that's the one, isn't it? The more luxurious cars. They could certainly fit into that uh, through Neo Capital. They are invested in two such services in China and one being the second largest. The sort of, um, uh, yeah, so that's certainly an option. Uh, once they bring out, say, that seven-seater people carrier, which uh, Americans so unpleasantly call minivans, they really are not. Uh, minivans, they're fantastically comfortable, luxurious, uh, floating ships. Um, you could then also see them running much more of a car sharing thing, because if you can get seven, eight, nine people, you could fit into that if you wanted to in a comfortable style. It could be the airport uh, back and forth van for you know your business travelers and those kind of things. A lot of uh, companies might use those services also uh, to ferry their staff about back and forth. Um, so yes, there is robotaxi revenue. What would be the interesting part about robotaxi revenue? Well, it's basically um, your uh, autonomous driving subscription, but on crack, uh, because you're going to charge people by the hour. You're going to charge them by the mile, or one or the other, possibly both, just like a taxi kind of does. And you can operate them um, basically around the clock. Now, not that many people are going to use them at four in the morning every day, but you are going to be able to use them a huge amount. Um, Vladimir here is saying, floating ships piloted by Captain Karen. <laughs> I love it. Vladimir has one of the greatest sense of humor in our community. Uh, appreciate you joining in, Vladimir. Thank you for that. Um, so robo-taxi revenue, yeah, that is, is something I haven't put it in yet. Uh, why? Well, we haven't really got visibility on that yet, have we? The only company in China with an actual proper robo-taxi fleet that is actually uh, properly charging and working has a license is Baidu. Uh, and that's an interesting company that got re hit rather heavily last week and the last two weeks, really, by the hedge fund sell-offs. Uh, and I think it was a very, very good buying opportunity. I, I certainly uh, bought some. Now, they're also in your life revenue. If you leave, listen to the Scots, uh, Bailey Gifford, they say that's going to be, I don't know, 100 million or billion or whatever. It's going to be a massive uh, item too. I, I'm not including it because I'm looking at this not really as a lifestyle business brand yet. I might once we start seeing that itemized in accounts, but at the moment we don't. But let's just uh, here for a laugh, uh, add up our our additionals, so for more of a bull case, that's $58 on top. So if we take our uh, 9204 and we add, 
happened there. Um, we want, oh, it's a merged, is it a merged cell? Okay, I have to do it manually. Uh, 92.04 uh, plus 58, uh, that is $150. Okay, so I would say that this is, um, this is a bull case, I would say. A bull case here in bold, in underlined is $150. Um, I personally don't see it by year end. And that's what I'm talking about here. And I don't want to be bearish on the stock, but I just think it would take um, a big advance in autonomous driving uh, revenue uh, is coming in. And I think the US is going to be really slow on autonomous driving because the regulators are all jumping up and down. And I bet uh, GM and Ford are calling their friends at the regulators every day going, slow down Tesla. We don't want this. We're still trying to figure out how to charge our cars. So they, they, the industry, the unions, they want to slow this down because they're all worried about job losses from a manufacturing point of view. Because making an EV, you need a lot less people. It's a lot less parts. It's a lot less complicated. Um, and all the drivers, right? Think of all the uh, Uber drivers, all the truck drivers, all the people who work in that sector. Um, the unions will slow this down as much as they can. And therefore, we are not going to see that revenue from Tesla kicking in uh, with the large Tesla fleet. So therefore, we're going to have to wait for China. Uh, and I do think in 2022, uh, 2023, we are going to get that revenue kicking in. And that's really when that is going to start flying. So at the moment, uh, we are working, I think, our ADR revenue, autonomous driving revenue, at a fairly conservative basis, to be honest with you. But um, from these numbers, with my you know, relatively low multiple and my, my, my growth falling off here. And um, I think a margin that is relatively conservative because Tesla's already achieved it and Neo, as I say, make more expensive cars. And also, simply, the more cars in the EV sector are produced at some point, everything will just get cheaper. All the components will get cheaper, batteries will get cheaper. But for me, $92 is actually a, a reasonable number now for year end. And I, I, I was looking at this Previously, if you watched me before, I was between, I was at $80, I lowered it to 63, now I'm back up to 92. Now, is it just because I've taken my meds today and I'm feeling happy, I've eaten lots of chocolate Easter eggs? Um, no, not really, because I, I think to, what I thought is that if you really want to look at this from the autonomous driving subscription revenue, which is quite frankly what every analyst is excited about, um, then you will need to look at this for a longer period of time, 10 years. Robert here is asking an insightful question. Um, are you saying 100% of new customers will, will subscribe to the AHASD service, Robert? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, why? Okay, two reasons. Uh, one, they all have money. Um, if you are buying cars that are, you know, 60,000 US dollars plus uh, in, in, in China, you've got money. Uh, so paying $100 a month to you isn't really a lot. If you are the only one of your friends who has the Neo, but you were too cheap to pay the 800 RMB for the subscription uh, for the aut autonomous driving, you're going to be laughed at, uh, you are going to be ridiculed, and you'll be uh, a, 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 a pariah in the Neo world. Uh, they'll throw, you know, um, egg tarts at you or something in Neo house. Um, I, I'm being half serious here and then half joking, Robert. Um, I think once you have autonomous driving, and you are able to sit in your car. And even if it is still the old style car with a steering wheel, which will eventually disappear, uh, and you can write messages on WeChat to your friends and take your eyes off the road, people are going to pay for that. Uh, because have you seen um, Chinese people? They are constantly, perhaps not texting, but they're constantly uh, on, on WeChat and, and writing and communicating. Uh, and working and, and doing all sorts of things. And people at that income level will certainly have limited time mostly um, or even if there are people of leisure uh, they are still organizing a million things so yes i think for them 800 RMB is is really not all that much money uh, they will just be like yeah of course i'll take that why why wouldn't i why, the car can drive itself or i have to drive it um basically also uh, there is going to be a huge um a i be i imagine and i'd love to see some numbers on that um that neo car owners the majority of them will employ a driver i believe and not necessarily for the Neo, but probably for uh, the, the, the minivan, <laughs> the Toyota Alphard. Uh, there's also the figure that I think something like 80% of current Neo owners have the charging station uh, installed in their house. And that's because they live in standalone houses. 
and those are the most affluent people in China. Now, as NEO grows and expands, it'll reach a bit more of a middle class segment. But still, I, I do think um, from an, a utility point of view and from also from a status point of view, uh, everyone's going to pay that. Absolutely. Um. Uh, Jordi, are you going to buy NEO stocks next time? And you indicate what price you're going to buy them at. Absolutely. Um, look, I'm actually, let's look at the chart here uh, and let's look at what our indicators are saying to us. Um, so here is our Williams R, which is just off the buy signal line here, which is where I've just put in that green line there. We've just not quite crossed it. When we cross it, we get a buy signal. So this here is a buy signal. Uh, that's a sell signal when it goes down, and this is almost there. If you look at this on a four-hour chart, which is more short-term, then yeah, you have a buy signal here. You can see it uh, very nicely and clearly where that blue line crosses the, uh, the green line I've put in. That's a buy signal. Uh, and that happened on the 31st of March, just around lunchtime or, or so. Um, I am going to try and get my hands on some new stock pre-market. Uh, that's my plan uh, tomorrow because uh, I think we are on a nice trajectory. Um, is it possible that we are going to hit sort of $46 and then, um, you know, something happens in the world and we bounce back down to say somewhere down here and then go up and that will be the third dip which is quite common it's almost sort of like a flag pattern in charts it's possible uh, but i think the fundamentals for me have just changed because i've seen tesla deliver around eighty thousand cars in the quarter in china and neo also growing year on year 4.2x um as has Tesla. So I think we are kind of at a point where these companies are just about to take off. And at the same time, their stock prices have tanked relative to where we were. Now we are still up 15x year on year. You have to bear that in mind, these are not super cheap stocks. But I think if you look at, or certainly from my perspective, and as always, guys, this is not financial advice. All the financial advice comes from the goats. I am just here to entertain. So hit the like button for the goats, guys. I keep donating to them. Um, where did my chart go? Here it is. I, I think uh, when I look at this and I'm doing this, I'm not kind of insane numbers. I mean, I did a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, we sort of did the, the Kathy Woods um, model and we applied that to NEO and then you get to $250 fair value. Okay. Um, to me, that's kind of, I don't quite see that yet personally because we have to get to robo taxis to get to that number. And we haven't really got robo taxi fleets yet, apart from Baidu, you've got, I don't know, 50 or something. So that business model is a bit untested. Uh, therefore, I'd rather not rely on it. But this here, I, I can see. Uh, so for me, uh, it, is, it is a buy. Um, so thank you very much there for those questions. Um, Love the, the minivan looking uh, for 1.2.5 million in your first quarter. Um, uh, will Neo make a profit this quarter? Ask uh, Pierce. Um, no, no, they won't. Um, I think they have a shot at making a profit next 2022 first quarter. Um, I think that's that's more likely. It depends actually very much on how much they spend in R and D. So they told us this year they're spending a billion US dollars on R and D. Next year they're going to spend two billion dollars on R and D. Um, if you have a growth company uh, that you believe that their R and D investment will pay fruits, will pay dividends, so to speak, uh, then the sooner they do it, the better. Quite frankly, because it just means you get you get there faster, and also uh, you are ahead of the competition. So a lot of it will depend on that. So I think really what people are looking at here are gross margins. And I think they will improve this quarter and each quarter probably during the year. Uh, and I think that's really for us the key number to look at. And then, yes, of course, we want to get this here. You know, for this year, I've got um, a minus 6.5% EBITDA. I think it's possible that that number will be closer to zero or fairly close to zero, in fact. Uh, but I don't expect it to be positive. And I actually think it will be the wrong um, thing to focus on. And now Lee Auto focus on that. If you want a, a Chinese EV stock that focuses purely on profitability at this point, Lee Auto is, is probably the better play. Um, Neo wants to grow. They want to build the best autonomous driving system. They want to build um, you know, the best system experience, service, infrastructure, sales network, rollout, 
grow, uh, launch more models, and all those things cost a lot of money. And yeah, they are front loading some of that, absolutely. Um, but I'd rather they do that than bring out a car every three years. I'd rather they just, you know, uh, spend now and then uh, we get the reward later down, down the track. Um, uh, Jordi is saying, are you looking for a low 40 or $41? Um, well, there is, if we look at this here, so, whoops, that's a green line I didn't want to paint. I like my green lines normally. Uh, so where are we at the moment? Uh, let me make this as big as I can for you. At the moment, we are hovering ever so slightly above what I had in here as 39.50 or so as a support line. Um, the next resistance up really uh, sits at about $42. So we might see quite a jump as we saw on the last trading day, right? You can actually see the candle touches that 4205 line. And I didn't put that line in after the trading day. It was already there. If you want to, if you don't believe me, uh, go back to some of my older videos and why, because we had uh, similar highs here on previous days. So that for me is a, a, a number uh, where uh, we might head back down a little bit, but quite frankly, given the, the, the great news that Tesla's put out, I think we have a good chance of getting going above that. Does it really matter, matter if you buy at 39.50, 39.38.50 39, or 41? Um, if you hold this in the long run, I would say from my perspective, not. Um, I think it doesn't really matter. It's always nice to buy lower, but I prefer to buy on rising momentum. And I think there's a very good chance when the market's open that our uh, buy indicators are all going to flash up. Buy, 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 buy. And if you don't want to uh, do... Um, technical analysis, but you still want to look at indicators, um, tradingview.com here has this sort of nice feature. And this is here on the day. So at the moment, it's still saying sell, uh, but really it's fairly balanced, right? 10 neutral, 9 sell, 7 buy. Um, that's for this sort of the summary, which is a bit of a rough summary. If you go into four hours, does that change it? Not much, right? You go into one hour, you get a buy, and that's because um, you know the last trading day was a positive. So I kind of expect this to swing over. I'm not predicting the predictors; that's a mistake. But I think there's a very high, high likelihood of that happening uh, at the beginning of the day uh, that we are going to see see uh, a lot of indicators um, showing us a buy. And I think also we might well end up above this 20-day moving average line, the red line here in the background, which just sits around 40, 60. And that will also give us some quite nice support because we've been below that for ages. And uh, in a rally, you're typically above that. Um, what about the bonds? They can push down the stock price. 80, 50. You're talking about the convertible bonds. I think you probably are. Um, well, we know about them. Uh, we know they are going to convert into shares in 2026 and 2027 mostly. Um, if the market knows it, it doesn't really do anything. It's if they issued new ones, then we'd have new dilution, but we are that dilution uh, should be priced in. Crypto Collector says they're better placed than buying NEO out there. Well, I suspect you might throw out crypto. Uh, I also like uh, crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. Um, are they better placed? Well, they are. I think quite possibly for this year's, uh, there are the raw materials for mining, um, basically all the stuff that feeds into the EVs, uh, whether it's rare earths or lithium or graphite and things like that, absolutely. And if you're interested in that, uh, we have by far uh, the best uh, research channel on that here on our Discord EV raw materials channel. Uh, there is so much research in there that is championed here by Robert, who's on this chat who uh, leads this research group. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Um, so if you want to get look into that, and I think really investing in mining without really understanding what they're mining is hugely dangerous. I had absolutely no idea because I'd never really invested in mining. Um, certainly not with something where chemicals come, come into question. Um, you know, if you, you think lithium is lithium, it really isn't. It depends on the raw material and, and many other things. Um, what program are you using? Uh, this here, this page you're seeing here is tradingview.com. It is free to use. You might get the occasional pop-up. I pay for it so I can share these charts with our members, but uh, you can you can use it for free and, and pretty much the whole thing is available. So it's, it's I think, uh, one of the best uh, free charting softwares out there. Um, um, Adil saying Biden wants to revive American industry and challenge the Chinese growth. Do you think this will impact NEO's penetration into the US? Well, at the moment, 
We don't necessarily need NEO to penetrate the US. Uh, basically, what are the two most exciting um, EV markets in the world, the fastest growing? It's China and China. Sorry, that was two, right? I kind of meant that. And number three is Europe. And the US is sort of a distant third, a very distant third. So quite frankly, they don't actually need the US to, to hit their numbers. Um, uh, I was talking about the 10 year bond. Ah, okay, uh, ITF. Okay, yeah, you're talking about the uh, 10 year bond yield, which is creeping up a little bit. Um, it was at 167. Well, the, the theory there is that because the employment and un unemployment numbers were better than expected, that might cause more inflation together with Biden's um, you know, latest Easter spending giveaways. Um, I kind of think that we've gotten used to it a bit because if you look at our a chart here. This is the 10-year bond yield on the uh, the 30th, 31st. You know, we were up at uh, what were our highs, 177 even, uh, and sort of around 172, above the 170 mark. And did the market collapse? No, it didn't. It did quite the opposite. So if I if I throw QQQ in in, in here for the mix uh, on a different scale, uh, you can see. Can you see that? Let me let me show you. So basically, from here onwards. From my odd pink line here onwards, uh, this area, uh, you can see what the 10-year bond yield's doing. It's going up, right? And what's the NASDAQ doing? Well, it, it, it was a little cautious. It was like, oh my God, what's happening? And then we're like, oh my God, let's buy. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to be as big as an issue. I think it'll create buying opportunities. Yes, continuously. Every time it hits sort of 1.8, 1.9, and particularly 2, uh, we will get buying opportunities but I don't think it will uh, have a long-lasting impact. Why? Because that small a change in inflation um, should cause about a 9% or so discount in, in the kind of model that I have here, discounted cash flow model. It should use about, about 9%, and the market has done that already. So I, I don't really see that, that working in. Um, uh, Adil said, Kathy Wood said in an interview that Neo will win the day. I think, okay, I appreciate you throwing that out, Adil. Thank you very much. That's a headline. It's reprinted quite a lot of the time. Um, I listened to that interview. She was asked about Neo, and she sort of said, yes, interesting. They do battery swapping, um, and that might win the day. Something like that. It wasn't a specific endorsement of Neo. Uh, she almost seemed like she wasn't particularly interested or knowledgeable on Neo. She just thought that battery swapping might be an interesting technology there. Uh, but it does sort of get repurposed through headlines and YouTubers, and and, and you know uh, we are all somewhat guilty of it. Uh, and then it becomes a, a story that uh, Kathy is, is is buying it. At the moment, I personally don't see it. I think they got their hands full here with Tesla. Um, Min Baker, what about Palantir and the flying taxis? Okay, we'll get on to that. What bloody flying taxis as HS? Um, uh, Robert is showing in here. I, I, I did see there was a question on MP materials. Uh, Robert is a huge fan on that. If you want to know something about it, literally go over to our channel uh, and uh, type in MP materials. Um, and you will see nine lengthy descriptions and links and summaries of research. Uh, so uh, that is, I think, probably your best place to go with some research. It'll save you several hours of your life and you'll know the answer. Um, <laughs> Christian, he doesn't want to join my Discord just to say Neo to the moon. Uh, I sometimes say in videos that, you know, we don't in our Discord all jump up and down and, and scream everything to the moon because I do think we are a bit more of a serious community. We actually look at facts and, and research and numbers and read things and listen to earnings calls and things like that. We can still have fun. And yes, Christians, you can still say everything to the moon if you want to. But I kind of think um, that is more kind of enjoying when a stock goes up and, and being optimistic. But we still need to understand that the basics are the fundamentals, because in the long run, fundamentals do matter. In the short run, of course, uh, you know, there are, there are other things. Um, um, HS, you say South African accent. Uh, yeah, some people sometimes say that. I'm German, actually, so it's perhaps a similar twang to the sort of uh, uh, Dutch root to uh, uh, South African languages. Uh, Philco, uh, good evening to you. Fantastic to have you uh, on here. Um, 
What price do you start looking at buying more barber, says Samir. I mean, I, I've got a fairly uh, full boat of barber uh, and I'm kind of waiting to reap the reward at this point. Uh, should it go back down below 220, I think it might be appealing again. Or if it ever goes back down towards 211, where it was at Christmas Eve, then I would be very, very tempted. Uh, Neo X Pang Lucid, Mr. Z is shouting out. Uh, gladly, we'll, we'll uh, throw her that. Uh, Adil, you thought I was British? That's very kind of you. Um, I, I masquerade well, but I am, I'm a German in hiding. Um, uh, so what shall we look at, guys? Uh, do you want to take a vote? Or do you want to look at, you want to look at Palantir? Do you want to look at X Pang or Lee or Lucid? Uh, shout it out and I'll go with what you guys uh, want, want to do. You can direct me here. I am at your service. That's sort of the whole point, really, I think, of the community that I cover things that you guys are interested in, in and not just what I'm interested in. Uh, so we have several choices here. Uh, Palantir, I see here, Joran throwing out. Um, if there is no one else typing as quickly as uh, Joran there, we are going to go to Pal Palantir. And also listed in Filco, of course, with throw out Blackberry. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, I'm getting votes here. Uh, uh, Jumia, uh, PLTR. Okay, let's just start with Palantir and then we work with, throughout some of the others. Uh, there is a fairly heavy Palantir contingent here. What's going on with Palantir? Um, have you watched my video on the nuclear deal? Well, if not, you are very naughty and you need to turn those subscribe alerts on. Uh, and, you know, look, look what I've done. Subscribe. Uh, that's how, how low tech we are. If you keep subscribing more, I can one day afford a, a, a flashing LED subscribe sign. So, um, you know, get me to that, guys. Palantir has a good news story out. Uh, they've got a, a fairly sizable government contract from the NNDA. Am I, am I, am I using the right acronym there? It's basically the government agency that's part of the energy department, but it's military, really. They look after the nuclear warheads and their security. And they had a contract out that's part of the policy to basically secure their system and, and make it safer and collect all the data and, and monitor everything. And how many companies applied for that contract? Have a guess. One. That one was Palantir. And who got the contract? Well, Palantir did. And the contract is worth um, at present 13 million US dollars. Um, but if it gets extended until 2026 or 2024, I don't quite remember. Watch my video. Uh, it becomes 89 million. And for Palantir, which is a billion dollar company in revenue, if I can remember correctly, that's that's a fairly sizable contract, right? Eight, nine percent of revenue. And are they likely to get it? Yes, I think these government contracts are sticky because once you selected your software vendor, you install it, you spend all the money getting it uh, working, provided the software works. And that by all accounts, Palantir software is good. I, I've yet to hear someone actually criticize the software. It's typically the politics or the uh, the, the management that get criticized. Uh, therefore, this is, I think, uh, going to be a continuous revenue stream because once you uh, establish a system to monitor the security and safety of your nuclear warheads, uh, is it going to be one thing that's going to get slashed in budget cuts? Fairly unlikely. I think it's going to be one of those things that sticks around. So that's a very positive news story there. And it's the first big contract under Biden. So we've seen a bit of a lull since the beginning of the year of new contracts being awarded by most government agencies. And I guess that's just people getting up to speed. And what are we doing? What's the policy? What shall we do? Uh, what are our plans here? So we are seeing that, um, you know, Palantir just provides a great service to the U.S. government. And therefore, um, that um, Robert is asking for a price target for Pampas diapers in 10 years. Robert, I'm afraid I'm the wrong man to ask on that subject. Uh, never touched a pair of uh, diapers or pampers in my life. Um, and what am I really planning on? Um, Palantir here. So what is the chart saying? Uh, the chart is, well, it's three days of, or last two days, higher lows, right? So uh, there is a positive trajectory here, uh, which is that. Um, from a lows point of view. I can't quite connect the lows, but the lows are the little tails here at the bottom of the candles. They are the low points for each day. Um, we closed, of course, down a percent while the market was going up, which isn't wonderful. Um, we closed at, can you see that is the high point here of four days ago, that tail here. 
and it's kind of the low point of two days before that. And then look at that here. Look at all these tails all touching that line. Uh, that's why chat analysis is useful because it pretty much tells you uh, where stocks open and close. Uh, certainly gives you parameters to work with here. Uh, so this 2307 is an important line here. Um, we did touch as low as the, uh, what is that line? Uh, the yellow one, the nine day moving average line, the yellow one in the background that provided support. That's also something interesting to note. Uh, so our uh, day, the last trading day, the 2273 is support and uh, exactly where we closed $23. It was a bit of a tough one to get through. Um, have we got real momentum at the moment? Not, not really. Uh, why? Because uh, look at this down here, this uh, pitiful little chart down here. It should cross through my horizontal line here to give us a buy signal. It isn't. Um, this is a buy. Yeah, uh, what I'm pointing out there, that was a buy signal, right? And just to illustrate that, that was on the 10th of March. Uh, at the time, we were around $25. And then we rallied up and then we got a sell signal um, around about here, uh, around about, well, actually that wasn't the greatest trade in the world, was it? But the buy signal, it gave you the right indication because at the top here, uh, we did a rally up. It just didn't get you out quickly enough. Um, that, that was the trouble, but it certainly got you in at, at the right place. So I prefer waiting for buy signals or very near buy signals. And you can look at this in a more short term basis. You can look at four hours. Okay, there we got a buy signal uh, on the 30th of March, uh, which was, um, let me put an arrow in here. It was basically up there. That was the buy signal. And that was not a bad one because at the time we were at $21 or so, $21.80. Uh, and we have, of course, gone up from that. Uh, but it's a bit of a wobbly one because you can see it's coming down a bit. It's going up a bit. That isn't important yet, but it isn't enough. You kind of want to get you want this to go a bit higher so that this buy signal actually converts into a day chart and therefore gives us more of a long-term uh, outlook. So at the moment, uh, what do I think Palantir is going to do? Um, I, I think it's still moving somewhat sideways. Um, I think what we might see here is, and I don't want to be a doomsayer on this because I also hold Palantir and I last bought at $28. Um, we might get this triple dip here. So well, this happens quite a lot and it's called a flag. Um, formation is you basically get uh, here is the flagpole and then you get one two and then you get three and then you get a rally and that's a very very common pattern in charts here uh, you get that sort of uh, a motion uh, that's kind of what i think is more likely uh, than a straight out rally unless they keep delivering some good news here uh, but there is something i think we all have to realize is that um they are going to get uh, you know i don't know billion and a half or something stock options this year and they're going to sell a lot of that why because when they get them they get a massive tax bill because they buy these stocks at pennies or cents rather and they're selling them at market price and therefore they're creating a capital gain that's taxable that's enormous and you know a billion or something like that so if their tax rate i don't know what their tax rate is but it's hundreds of millions and therefore they are going to sell shares to pay for that so Philco is asking for the price target for orange juice. Um, it depends on how much you drink in the morning, Philco. Support the orange juice market. Um, um, price target for OJ. Get a frozen can of concentrate. Fill it up on a free spring water. 99 cents for three quarters. Sounds delicious, Mr. Z. Um, can we do a quick technical analysis on Novonix? They are a key company for synthetic graphite. Absolutely, Robert. We'll definitely do that. Let me cover one or two of the other things that were thrown out here the most. There is definitely um, a Neo in here, for those of you who've missed us at the beginning. So we can do a, a wrap there. And um, uh, Xpang, I think, is also thrown out quite a bit. So let's do a quick recap on Neo. So you, you see where we are, and then that's a logical handover to XPang, and then Robert will certainly look at uh, your interesting synthetic graphite play there. You can't make cars or batteries without graphite, basically. And so graphite, key, key, key uh, ingredient, really, and I think quite an interesting play. Uh, so what have we got here? Well, as I just said, we have basically here uh, one, two, three, four, five days in a row with higher lows each day. 
And that's quite a positive. That actually tells quite a story here. Uh, my line, of course, doesn't connect all the low points because they are a bit uh, too scattered for me to do that. But the, you get the gist. Basically, the bottom of these tails are higher each day. And that's, that's very, very good. Uh, we closed at 42.75. Sorry, at 39.66, rather, um, I was going, going mad, uh, which is above our 39.50 support line, which is important. Um, we have gone up to this pink publish line here, which is 42.05, which I painted in before we did this. So it just goes to show how useful chat analysis is because it was the high point here and it therefore gave us some resistance. So that will continue to be resistance. Um, so what we are expecting or what I'm expecting, I think on Monday, we're going to be off to a flying green start, I would say, uh, on the basis of Tesla's stellar numbers beating expectations by 10%. Um, if we can break through um, these uh, numbers here, and I've put them in here, 40, 80 or thereabouts, uh, 4209, 4281, don't worry about the exact cent because my lines are never 100% accurate, uh, then we are basically resistance free. Uh, and then we can live happily ever after uh, above sort of $42, $43 uh, until about $46 is where the next uh, resistance lines would be up here, the, these green ones. So um, for me, these are the numbers I'm going to watch out for on, on Monday. Uh, and in terms of support, of course, um, $39.50. And, and then uh, there is some more support uh, down here. Is certainly um, around the sort of $38 mark or so. But I, I wouldn't really expect us to turn in that direction on Monday because, well, Tesla had a fantastic uh, delivery numbers over the Easter. So the Easter bunny is happy and therefore we should be happy. Um, guys, I see there are lots of you on this channel. And I love you for that. If you hit that like button, I love you even more. And I'll donate one cent for every one of your likes to these lovely fluffy creatures here in these animal sanctuaries that you guys select. And let me just show you uh, what we donated today or rather what I donated today. Uh, I donated $301 for March likes uh, and I, we are now up to $694 US dollars to Animal Sanctuaries. So it is, I think, a good deed. So smash that like button, guys. Uh, I really appreciate it. And of course, uh, subscribe so I can get a better subscribe sign, if nothing else. <laughs> um, right. Uh, shall we then lead over to XPang and then we'll uh, uh, throw open the chat again to uh, anything uh, else you are uh, wanting to talk about here. Now, XPANG's chart here, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Again, I put that purplish line in here uh, to illustrate that we have one, two, three, four days in a row here of lower, higher lows. Uh, and that can be as important as higher highs, in fact. Um, similarly, XPANG closed near the lower end of their, their price on, on Thursday. Uh, and what was that price? Well, it was exactly the high point of the previous day. So up 1.2%, which is precisely the point, the highest point of the, the, the Wednesday trading day. And that's, again, technical analysis would kind of uh, sort of tell you that story. And we are also trading here. What was the low of the day? It was our Fibonacci line here at 36 uh, or, or thereabouts. Um, so we now have a resistance line at the where we were at. Uh, the top point, really, I suppose, that 39.21, our high there is, I suppose, another resistance line here around about, around about there. So you basically have a support at 36.51. I, I suspect that will hold. Uh, we have resistance at 38.39. If we break through that, we have to get through the high of Thursday, which is 39.32. And then look, there is nothing in between. It's basically free air, do whatever you like, uh, jump up and down as far as you can and scream to the moon uh, up to sort of 43.84. So provided we get through uh, these levels here, um, the ones I've put in here, uh, we have a good chance of recovering a lot of this lost ground and going back up to $43 or so. Um, hit that like button, guys. So thank you very much, Diego there. Appreciate that. Um, Right, uh, lots of, uh, what were any other stocks I missed out here? Do shout them out again. Uh, we can always do a poll and I'll do the most popular ones. Um, uh, Simia, hello to Sweden. Good morning, morning. Baba target this week. Uh, La Jolly, La Jolly, it's pretty much the same target it was last week. Now, tech stocks did get hit over the head a bit um, in, in the Chinese sector, so there might be a moderate recovery. But really, what's going to move the stock is not numbers or the market. It's it's the regulators fining Alibaba and, and saying, hey, we're going to relist. So I think it is one that needs patience. Uh, Philco says, uh, EVs can't operate without BlackBerry's QNX. 
which is present in 23 out of 25 of the top EV manufacturers. And therefore he requires, he screams, look at BlackBerry. All right, Shulker, we'll do it uh, for you. Uh, here it is. This is BlackBerry. BlackBerry had an earnings call, which Shulker um, listened to, probably not that many other people listen to. Uh, Basically, BlackBerry is kind of converting itself from its old business model. They're selling off their patents and they're kind of reinventing themselves as a sort of software security service provider, especially for the EV sector and also other sectors. Um, the numbers did not impress. I think they're basically, it's funny, they're kind of sort of rebirthing themselves. They're going back to where they started. They're becoming a toddler again, a startup. And that's why this chart is looking rather uh, rather hideous here. Uh, decent day on Friday, up 2%, which builds a little bit of support, uh, but not much because we are, well, the trouble with any stock that does this here, this to the moon movement is you build no support whatsoever. And then what happens? Well, you basically do that uh, afterwards. So um, these massive rallies are not ideal for stocks. Uh, Let's look at some indicators, uh, Philco. Uh, let's see if we can find some positivity in here. Well, it's oversold. Uh, that would be my, my positivity down here. Uh, when you are below this dashed line here with these kind of momentum indicators, as Williams are, uh, you are in the oversold territory. At some point, you exit the oversold and you get a rally. Uh, now, we had that over here uh, in December. We were in here for quite some time, for a, a good two weeks. And then in, in, in February, we were in here, well, for the whole month of February, we were in here. And then we shot up, we got that rally, and then up here that coincided with that rally. And similarly, of course, here, uh, this rally coincided with that one. So you can, I, I would personally, if I was going to buy BlackBerry, uh, wait for this to, to kind of uh, become, uh, you know, cross actually get a buy signal here. Um, other indicators that might be useful here, I mean, MSCD is going to sell, tell you it's a sell, absolutely. It did that on the 24th of March. I'm um, just thinking if we can find some positivity. Squeeze momentum, perhaps. Uh, is there a squeeze on? No, there isn't also, so there isn't enough momentum in there. So, yeah, I feel quite, it's not a huge amount, I can sort of sadly say uh, in that, because uh, look at the chart over here. Where is our support? Well, there is support at 7.44, but you don't want to hear that. Uh, I suppose you could find some support uh, at these levels over here. Let me just get a pen. Uh, at this sort of level over there, you could uh, try, kind of say, well, that's about the $8 mark. And therefore, around the $8 mark over here, we're going to have some support levels. Uh, but that's really about it at the moment, I think, from a technical point, from a technical point of view. Uh, Jimmy, our price target says Diego. Okay, we can have a quick look at that. Um, as a European, I do think that Neo would sell like hotcakes once it's introduced over here. Uh, Ken, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, yeah, I also think that Europeans are actually open to it. I think it, the price point is, is is quite attractive because really, a um, you know, if it's a sixty thousand US dollar car, say with pretty much all the extras, uh, then in euros that's fifty four thousand euros or so. Uh, that's a fairly decent price compared to the high end. BMWs, Mercedes, with all the extras in, because the, the you know Neos are fairly well well equipped, equipped rather. So um, thank you for sharing that. There. Um, now let's have a quick look at what shall we have a look at? Uh, let me start with Robert because Robert provides more research than anyone else, and I think anyone out over on our Discord uh, will realize that. And if you want to join the Discord, guys, uh, Patreon, uh, do do it. Uh, there are, um, I don't know where it's gone here, but uh, you can see all my models are over, obviously over there and you can um, you can join here through these tiers uh, and I think you will uh, find a good return on your investment. Uh, if you uh, don't think so, well, you can simply leave again. Uh, there is, I'm not going to hold you to it, but yeah, you can see here the levels at the moment still available are the uh, 1895, 2395. And you can see all the wonderful stuff that we have on here. Uh, lots of research, um, our top sector for the year, my daily trades, members only videos, etc. Lots of testimonials, but enough of the adverts. Uh, let's get into stocks. So I'm going to open a um, different stock chart for this. Otherwise, I mess it up for the members and they're looking at Neo and they're getting uh, what Robert is uh, throwing out, uh, which was NVNXF, NVNXF, Novonix. So you're saying that this over-the-counter stock, Robert, is a synthetic 
graphite play. Can you share with us where they are making that synthetic graphite or what stage of production they are at? I think that might be interesting to see. So what happened here on the last trading day? Let me uh, zoom in on this a little bit so you can see this. Uh, well, you can see that our low point of the day was the Fibonacci line and Fibonacci retracements are probably the easiest thing if you want to start with technical analysis. Uh, you go to a website like tradingview.com and you find an auto fib retracement. It just chucks it in for you in the right place. Uh, you don't have to do much thinking and it does give, give you the low point of the day. So you would have known, ha, that is probably the low point of the day. Maybe I could buy something at that point. Um, if you are so minded. I mean, I would never trade purely on technicals. You have to still understand what it's all about. Um, and we opened the day uh, with our nine day moving average. Um, and it, it so went down a little bit and then went up uh, close near the top, which was also the opening price uh, three days prior. Yeah, so again, there is always that psychological linkage between share prices here. You can see that dotted line here uh, connecting nicely uh, with that. Um, one thing I would see from this immediately is that, yes, we had two green days, but look at the volume down there. There isn't any uh, and no volume and rising stock prices means not a lot of kind of strength behind that. Yes, we went up 10%, but we went up 10% on perhaps half the volume we are used to. If I put a line in here, you can see, uh, let me make that, can I make that line a bit more colorful so you can see it? I'll make that a nice big purple line. Um, and you can see down here where we are in the last two days with our volume, a very, very, very small volume. So it's not necessarily therefore the most long lasting of rallies. Uh, that's what I would always say. In a, in a rally, you want lots of volume. In a sell-off, you want very little volume, provided you're long on the stock. Um, let's have a quick look at some indicators then. Williams are here. So creeping up nicely. Uh, out of the oversold territory. This down here is the oversold territory underneath that dotted line, uh, but it isn't quite a buy signal yet. In fact, we haven't had a buy signal since about the 16th, 15th, 16th of February, uh, when I can't snap that line in place absolutely accurately. Uh, that's perhaps one of the few downsides of this uh, software, uh, but you can see there where that blue line crosses the dotted line, that was a buy signal. Uh, and that up here was probably the end of the 12th of February which was not a bad call because it it uh, it got you would have gotten you in I would say at about two nineteen and then when would it have, it have gotten it you out um, basically around here it would have gotten you out uh, at the beginning of that day at about two sixty so not bad right um, what is that twenty percent upside uh, from from that trade uh, I, and therefore I would kind of think well why risk it now. That's, that's sort of my, my thinking. Why, why am I going to go against an indicator that worked so well? Now, I would normally not just backtest this once as indicator. I would go back a bit more and backtest this some more. Um, and, and saying that, it's also interesting to have a look at the stocks uh, kind of performance, the volatility, a look at what is the volatility day, day on day. And in a lot of these sort of mining or is a synthetic graphite company, is that a mining place still? Um, manufacturing, I suppose, is, is, is the correct thing. It is a highly volatile stock that quite happily goes up uh, 10 and 15 percent up and down during the day. So it's not for the faint hearted. Um, we don't have we have support down here. Actually, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty good support line here. Why? Uh, let me show you that. It's it's once it's uh, um, maybe I'll draw it. It might be quicker. Uh, there's another one here. Um, that's the worst arrow in the world, right? Anyone's ever drawn. And there's another one here. As you can see here, we have it, the, it was the um, open of that day. It was the low point of that day. And then again, we go back over here. It was again the low point of that day. So it's a triple support line. So 159 or thereabouts is a, perhaps it's 160 actually. That's probably it. Uh, I, I, yeah, actually it's exactly 160. Uh, so I'll put in a little tag here. So 160 is a good support line. Um, so therefore, I would be minded uh, to hope for a bit of a mini crash, and I'm not in on the stock, obviously, uh, and snap it up when it heads towards the 160. Uh, I think that would be sort of my my thought. And if it falls below that, well, then we are in trouble because there isn't a great deal of support below that uh, for quite some time. Uh, this line down here, it was just for illustrate to illustrate um, 
the volume. Uh, so yeah, there isn't really, because it was again, this massive movement upwards. So really, if you fall below 160, uh, you, are, you, are, you are kind of in free fall land. Uh, and that's kind of the risk here, really, uh, I, I would say. Uh, thanks very much for that suggestion there, Robert. I'd love to hear some more about it. Um, Uh, hey Jordi, uh, thank you very much. Enjoy playing soccer with your kids. Uh, eat some chocolate Easter eggs. Uh, we all deserve it. Um, Robert is saying, Novo Nick's plant here is in Tennessee. It's next door to VW's Gigafactory. VW said on power day is going to introduce synthetic graphite. Yes, we both heard that. Uh, we were occasionally uh, you know, woken up from our slumber on that uh, power day uh, by, by some interesting uh, bits of news. Uh, so they are in uh, Chattanooga. Tennessee, uh, and they are, you are saying they're selling worldwide. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think so. So interesting. So you're basically looking for that mix. Say they make a 50-50 mix of um, natural and, and, and synthetic, perhaps because synthetic is still more expensive. Uh, they might use uh, some Novo Nix. Interesting, Robert. Interesting stock. I, I would say at the moment, um, yeah, the momentum doesn't look particularly happy yet. I'm going to write this down. Novo Nix, the synth graphite. I just cover that in our next members only TA on all of our mining stuff. On a lot of these mining plays, we have quite a lot of coverage that on that on our channel here. Um, why do I put it over here? It's not really to exclude anyone, but it's just because if I did a TA on mining stocks on YouTube, YouTube would show it to three people and would show my next 10 videos to two people. And it just punishes you like that, the algorithm. So it's so stuff like this that I think is super exciting. And I think people will talk about this in a year's time in, in a mainstream way. But at the moment, we have to sort of hide it in private uh, videos over here on, on the Patreon. Um, time is semiconductor, let me sure we can look at that. Um, uh, Robert says that the quantum scape batteries are ex insanely expensive. You think it's going to implode, Robert? Okay, interesting. Um, US will implode, says Robert. You see these things I write down, Robert? You see how important uh, you are? <laughs> um, uh, so, so Barber here, uh, Calm um, Menno. Okay, let's have a quick look at Barber. A few of you have also thrown that out. Uh, let me just show you what, what the chart says. Let's see what the tea leaves say. Well, it's a bit more than tea leaves. There is actually science behind this. Uh, what happened to our Barber chart? Ah, we are on. Ah. It's a minute chart. That's what happened. <laughs> uh, I, I was thoroughly confused there for a moment. Um, here we go. This is the real chart. Uh, you can, of course, see here the red uh, arrow is pointing to the ANT IPO cancellation sell-off. The yellow arrow is pointing to the antitrust investigation sell-off. Uh, and we are still uh, living under the cloud of that. Um, we have fallen below the 225 line, which has been quite good support, uh, which is that gray line in here. It's also Fibonacci support line. And you can see we, you know, we have plenty of days here where that is the low here, one, two days. Uh, there was the opening of that day, but we occasionally dip below it. And then typically the market buys back in because they just think Baba is too cheap uh, at 224. Uh, uh, and that's really what, what, what's been happening. If you extend that line to, um, let me just extend that line to over here, you can see even at the beginning of January, uh, that line was always our support pretty much, right? You can see that here touching again, one, two, three times. Yeah, we do dip below it occasionally, but we always recover above it, except for Christmas Eve, which was 2.11, uh, which was surely the buying opportunities or, or buying opportunities. So um, is there massive momentum in this? Um, I, I'm afraid not. It, this is just, it has this, regulatory overhang on it. Um, all the bad news stories from every grumpy journalist around the world are resting on its shoulders. Um, I think it's going to go up 30% at the end of the year uh, when we get um, Alibaba fined and we get a, a, a news of and relisting. Why is it going to relist? Absolutely, in my view. Uh, and let me just show you what JD has done here. If I throw a JD into the mix here, um, and move JD up a little bit because that's kind of how these two compare uh, over time. They're kind of moving, you see the orange line here, they move quite similarly. Um, and we are down here, right, with our uh, Misery Baba stock. So that difference uh, between 
Neo, uh, sorry, Baba and JD. And JD has gotten hit fairly hard, and I think quite a bit of that. This here uh, is is part of the um, well, it's a bit it's a bit politics, and it's also uh, the hedge funds selling off. But basically, uh, this gap from here to where Neo is. Barbarous. I just keep thinking Neo, guys, and that's how excited I am. Uh, that's worth about uh, $80, $90 or so uh, just to catch up with, with JD's movement. And quite frankly, I think Barbar has better numbers than JD. So uh, for me, that's the play I'm waiting for. Uh, but one has to be a patient soul uh, and believe in this uh, because it won't happen overnight. I think it could take all year. Um, okay, you guys are talking here about a Tesla's battery, the 4680 cells. They are 40% natural graphite, 40% synthetic graphite, and 50% silicon. And they exceed the performance of solid state batteries uh, like QS and are far less expensive. Interesting. So, Tesla onto a good thing here, uh, but that means they're going to need a lot of graphite. Um, so the main selling point, Robert says, of uh, solid state is weight. If they're light, it'd be good for EV tolls. Um, true. Uh, perhaps also, do you think eventually for trucks where weight is an issue, uh, because trucks typically are loaded fairly close to the uh, permitted road weight. Um, and at the moment, I think if you keep stacking on batteries, you just make them heavier and heavier, and they don't really go any further. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's have a quick look then at uh, Taiwan Semiconductors, because uh, Lily threw that out so kindly. While I'm enjoying my hot cup of water, I think quite like hot water is there. Uh, TSM. Now you would think that semiconductors would be absolutely flying off the shelf. Uh, they're increasing their prices, but are they? Well, in the long run they are, uh, but in the short run they were also hit by the sort of Nasdaq sentiment uh, sell-off. Uh, flew off the shelf on Thursday by five percent. Uh, what held it back? Well, it's the fifty point fifty point moving average line here. Uh, you see that black line there, and I'll magnify that for you. Um, that's what stopped us, basically. We closed just above it, uh, but that's kind of what pulled us back. Uh, and that's also um, very, very close to the Fibonacci line here, resistance at 125, so uh, hence us closing at 124. Uh, though pretty much at the top of the day, so uh, that's a pretty positive story here. The stock ended very much on a, on a high here. Um, Big movement, really. Uh, let's have a quick look at a couple of indicators here. Let's have a look at Williams R. So that got us a massive buy signal here uh, around about the 25th of March uh, and continues to fly upwards. Now, it is in overbought territory. Um, is it overdone yet? Possibly, but it hasn't turned around yet. So uh, I don't sort of count um, these as sell signals until we are uh, sort of down here again uh, near that uh, 50 point horizontal line that I'm putting in here. Um, slightly slower indicators like MACD, which complement quite nicely to something like RSI or Williams R, also gave us a buy signal here on the 30th of March. Uh, and I'll show that to you if you're on a small screen. You see here we are crossing that blue line, crosses the orange MACD line, giving us a nice buy signal. And then you can see the buy momentum here, these green bar charts getting bigger. Um, and that's quite nice. And also what you can see here, actually the volume on Thursday was very healthy. Uh, one of the, the bigger sort of volume days in, in recent times. Uh, the volume was 17.8 million. Uh, so it's, it's a, a buy-in with volume and momentum, um, therefore looking pretty good. Uh, now, the only thing uh, I suppose is that we are here uh, hitting these resistance lines and we are, have flown off quite a bit. So it is possible that we might bounce back, say, to the 120 support line and then zigzag a little bit sideways. Um, because we have had a pretty big jump here, right? We have gone from 108 to 124 in the space of what, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six days or so. So um, there is a chance we are near the top of a peak here, but it hasn't turned around yet. So at the moment, indicators are still bullish on that. Uh, Robert says, I think NEO is joined at the hip with CATL. Uh, I, I think so too. Uh, they, well, through NEO Capital, they invested in their. Uh, and I think uh, they are uh, planning most of their, their batteries together, which isn't a bad company to be joined at the hip with because CATL is the world's largest battery manufacturer, right? I mean, Tesla also get their batteries from them. Uh, Robert, uh, they are indirectly uh, c connected. So we have Cap uh, Neo Capital, which is a venture, well, a private equity 
a fund uh, that was set up with Sequoia uh, China and Hill House, uh, which is loading incredibly slowly for some reason. And, and, and NEO is basically the, the fund manager there. And they have invested in lots of things in the sort of ecosystem of the EVs. Uh, absolutely no idea why that isn't loading. Um, I, I, I'll post the link uh, for you guys here in the chat. So as my page isn't loading for some strange reason, you can check it out and you'll see uh, that one of the companies they're invested in there is CATL, which is the world's largest battery manufacturer and lots of other exciting places. And it's kind of building an ecosystem around them. And that's sort of the Chinese tech way of building this. You don't just do everything yourself. You invest in lots of companies. And that's what that 10 cents have done, right? They have pretty much every investment I come across at the moment. Uh, who's in it? It's 10 cent. Uh, you know, they were in, 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 a, in a lot of uh, EV startups. Uh, the, the Lilium uh, EV toll uh, flying object thing uh, that Palantir are a part of, uh, 10 cent again is an investor there. Uh, and of course, many other companies. So that's kind of what they do. It's sort of Alibaba 10 cent model. Uh, you just invest a little bit of private equity into all of these, and therefore you have your fingers in the pies. Um, um, Jim Kramer versus Kathy Wood. Who would you bet on, says Calm Me Out there. Well, I mean, Kathy Wood has a good track record. Um, uh, Jim Kramer is a rather loud gentleman. Um, I mean, he plays to his audience, right? So I think you have to always take what he says with a pinch of salt. Uh, Kathy is certainly somebody who looks for massively disruptive, outperforming stocks. So she, you know, she's selling every single day PayPal and Facebook and things like that, uh, which I'm buying every day because I think they're fantastic value uh, and, and hugely profitable and will compound and, and give me, you know, 15, 18% a year or something like that, which, which I'd be very happy with. Uh, but she is looking for that. She is looking for safety. She's looking for the, 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 the unicorns, the breakouts, the ones that make industry. So um, I, I think that's kind of what people have to bear in mind. And if a portfolio is 100% an ARC fund, I, I think there's, there's a pretty high, high volatility and risk level in that. So I think um, when markets have sell-off periods, I think people are starting to realize, and that's kind of what's been happening in the last three weeks or so, uh, quite substantial outflows there. But I think uh, they are a very good company. They're researching good, good, good ones, and they have uh, you know, backed uh, quite a lot of real winners. So I certainly wouldn't write her off. It's a little bit like people are writing off uh, you know, the Warren Buffett school of thought because why he underperformed in 2020. Well, his answer would be, well, you know, let's talk again in 20 years time and, and see who's done better. And I think uh, we have to give these schools of thoughts their place just because somebody had a bad six months or nine months compared to a different sector that was lifted off for, for all sorts of reasons. It doesn't mean uh, one's good and one's bad. I think there's a place for both. Hey, Adil saying, do you think Hong Kong listing of NEO will be positive or negative in the short term? Any update on the timeline? Recent Hong Kong listings uh, have hammered uh, Baidu, et cetera. Well, the Baidu one there, uh, yes, it got hammered. Uh, but look at the timeline of that with uh, what was happening with, um, what's his name? Uh, Bill Huang, uh, the Archegos uh, sell-off there. So that kind of coincided uh, with that. Uh, so I think it's a little bit of an unfair one here, the, the, how hard they got hit. It was just a bad timing, really. They got, basically got somehow shorted or, 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 or you know, sold in a panic by, by the investment banks once that fund basically went belly up. So I, I think they are making a nice recovery here. I did buy some of that on the 29th, which I'm rather happy with. And of course, I shared that with the community uh, to let you guys know uh, that I thought it was massively oversold. I think generally speaking, when things fall off a cliff, sort of 25, 30 percent and the business hasn't changed. So, OK, if you are a plug and, you know, your accountant is blind, uh, then, yes, I run and I don't jump in on that because there, there is some scary stuff in there. But if a company has had no actual announcement, nothing strange or odd going on there and it drops 25 percent like that. Um, and it isn't massively overvalued. I don't think Baidu is. Uh, and if you're interested in that, guys, again, come over to the Discord. We have an AI channel, and that's really what uh, Baidu is all about. Uh, and there is some really quite interesting research on Baidu on here uh, that I've thrown in. I, I can't find it at a, at a, at a flash moment because there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, but there is a lot of interesting stuff in there. So um, I wouldn't take this as a measure of what Hong Kong listings do. I think the neo listing will... Well, A, it'll calm people down because it's now dual listed. It will be. 
in terms of timeline, I did a video video on that, uh, the timeline in the uh, listing rules. If I remember correctly, it's 12 to 18 weeks, uh, but it could be faster. Why? Because it's a secondary listing. When you are in Hong Kong, you're listing and you're already listed on what they call a recognized exchange. And New York Stock Exchange is one of those. They pretty much waive most of the requirements to just say, OK, yeah, you've done, done a good job because you satisfy the SEC. Therefore, you satisfy us uh, and, and bam, you're listed. It's pretty much like that. So they don't have to do jump through that many hoops. There's still a little bit of questioning and, and, and that kind of thing, but it takes not very long. So it could be, I would say, anywhere from sort of uh, probably four to 12 weeks, I think is, is possible if they're rushing it, which I think they probably are. Um, Robert is throwing in, you expect ArcX to do much better than they seem to be doing right now. Well, they're not buying much, right? Uh, they're not really, I put that also on our Discord here in our sort of space drone stock. Um, look at these are, can you see that? You can see that. I'm mag can I magnify it for you here. Uh, this is the, the the daily trades of ARC. Everything they buy, ARC, F, 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 F. Um, nothing, right? No X. Uh, and uh, the next day, a little bit of ARC X. Yeah, apologies, guys. That's really small. Only one buy, and that's Trimble. Uh, and they bought 453,000 shares. Um, what's Trimble worth? Trimble stock. So 453,000 shares times 80, um, that is 400, sorry, times 80, uh, that's 36 million. So they kind of got an inflow from somewhere, or maybe they sat on some cash of $36 million. So not really the massive trajectory that I think a lot of people were expecting. Uh, so it just isn't attracting the money, I think, because otherwise they'd invest it and they're not buying it. And I, I get these updates every day and I, I love ARC for that. I wish every fund in the world was required to give us daily updates. Um, uh, beyond here, out to the moon. Um, what do you guys think about ChargePoint? Um, I'm not a big fan, Ken. Why? They will make some money. Yes, they will rally. The stock will... But what's the long-term business model here? Like petrol pumps. Do you buy petrol pumps? It's the same business, really, isn't it? So I, I just don't really get the moat. Um, what, what is the long-term moat? If the margins are high, someone else is going to put one next door, right? So um, uh, Michael says, ARC exports some decent long-term names. Well, actually, we did a rather stellar job with that. We predicted, I'd say, 90% of the portfolio. Uh, here, I, we did it, I can, you can see it here, 23rd of March, ArcX, Kathy Secret Space Fund revealed her stocks because she had a fund in Japan, um, which I listed out here, uh, and uh, we basically looked at what is in that, uh, and, and this is what it is, I made a spreadsheet of that, and I've only gone through this literally on a live course, I haven't gone through all of them, but I bolded some of the key names that we had and that are now in hers, I, th I think there are others, so we called out pretty much all of them, certainly the, the, the big ones. Uh, so it wasn't really a big surprise. She didn't sort of uncover something huge. I think a lot of the money that wanted to flow into the space had done it from the announcement onwards. Um, so perhaps they could have... I think the, if you're launching something where the markets are sort of a little bit on the edge and, you know, we had a bit of a Nasdaq sell-off, uh, then it's, it, it's tough. But I think judge them on their performance in a year or two or three or four or five uh, rather than on, on a week. Um, Uh, Robert says, ChargePoint says their long-term mode is long-term contracts with service stations. But how long-term can they be? Do you think a service station says, yes, you can have this spot for the next 50 years? It seems unlikely to me. I think, um, okay, no one's going to rip out equipment once it's installed. That's true. But you also can't charge more for the electricity than the next pump, right? So I, I kind of think that the, the, unless there's some government regulation or something, which I don't see, um, 
I, I think the margins will get eroded. Uh, you know, petrol stations, basically, I'm sure when they started putting them up, there was probably one on each side of the road competing. And then we've seen all the oil majors buying them all up and basically uh, dividing the space and, and not really competing with each other because it's just silly, isn't it? So they just say, well, you put one there, I put one 150 miles down the road. And I pretty much think that's, that's how they've done it. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, Ken says, my argument for SPE is that there are leaders and charges and gas pumps that already exist when I started my investing journey. Uh, Ken, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm just sort of throwing out there in five years or say 10 years time when the charging in network is built, what's the margin going to be? Um, you know, I, I don't know what's a petrol station margin. It's probably going to be similar to that. You could say, okay, you don't need to bring fuel there that will save you money, but I think it's just going to get passed on. I don't know if we have a petrol station margins. Fuel sellers pumping own margins than a passive savings. A cluster analysis of petrol profit margins. Looks interesting in Australia, but it'll be the same all around the world. Uh, does it give us a number? Come on, guys, talk less. Give us a number. Uh, Mikey, someone did some serious research here. No, so I mean, I, I, I was just hoping we might stumble something. Petrol prices low, but gross margins at record high. Yeah, but what are they? Why gas station margins are razor thin here? 2% profit was actually the strongest average margin that private gas stations had seen in the past 10 years. So that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's, uh, it's like Amazon. Amazon's e-commerce business is similarly appalling. Uh, so I think you are going to see a wave and you can make some money with it because everyone's like, oh my God, this, they're going to build all of these. They're going to get all that money. Let's invest. But at some point, fundamentals are going to kick in. And that's a little bit like what I keep saying about Airbnb. Everyone's excited about it because it's a great idea but there's no moat. So eventually, I think the bottom will fall out of those stocks. So I would just, you know, if you're riding that, uh, that uh, just think about uh, whether it'll, it'll tank at some point. Um, Robert says, be, be British Petroleum is getting into charging in Europe. Expect other petrol companies to do the same in the US. Absolutely. They're, why? They have the perfect locations. Uh, they have the infrastructure. They have the shops, they have the bathrooms, they have the restaurants, it's already there. You know, the, the motels, it's all there, the parking lots. So uh, the most sensible thing is actually if the government government mandates that every petrol station in the country has to install a certain number of, of, of electric charges, and then you'd be done. Uh, we don't have to really think about anything else. So I think that would be the best use of, of the infrastructure that's already there, because Petrol ones will go out of business otherwise also. It doesn't really make much sense. So yeah, I think there will be a huge squeeze on margins there. Um, what's a fair buy price on Tesla and NEO, uh, says uh, Rao here. Well, actually, I think at the moment we're looking pretty good uh, in terms of fair value. If you watch the beginning of this chat when we were going through my fair value at $92 here for NEO at the end of the year, um, that's a 230% upside, something like that. Um, and I think Tesla also looking actually pretty appealing at 600 something dollar levels. Um, I think I think in the long run, that's, that's a pretty good price point, actually. Yeah, I do. Um, the money on the petrol station is the junk people buy on the shop next to it. Uh, Pascal, absolutely. Uh, and with EVs, you'd have to build those junky shops. You have to put the KFC drive-throughs next to it. Uh, and, and the petrol stations already have that. So therefore, if I'm driving an EV and I need to charge it and I can drive past where I've always been refueling and I can get my KFC if I like that sort of thing, uh, or, you know, buy a newspaper or a Snickers or something, um, then I'm going to go there. I'm not going to go to the one that has zero facilities. So um, that's actually why I think what NEO is doing in China is smart. They are partnering A, with petrol stations and B, with shopping malls um, out of town, sort of shopping mall uh, centers, because people are going to go there anyway. And that's perhaps another logical place where you could put them in the US. Uh, but I'm not going invest to in invest in the guys that build the station, the charging station and lay the... Um, cables. I, I'd rather invest in the copper and the cables or something like that, uh, because at least then I'm getting demand uh, for more electricity uh, rather than just this sort of a short-term play. Um, a charge point will bring in other services, says Richard. I'm sure they will, uh, Richard. And I'm not saying it's a 
terrible business. I'm not saying they're going to go out of business. I'm just saying that eventually down the line, uh, they are going to end up with a 2% profit margin. And therefore, um, I, I'm out. I can buy Microsoft with a 48% EBITDA margin. Um, why wouldn't I buy that instead? I mean, I appreciate you might be riding a sort of uh, momentum wave here and you might make a nice chunk of money there, but I think in the long run, I'd rather hold something that actually uh, makes that money. Um, Getty, what's your price target for Baidu for the end of the year? Getty, thanks for asking that. You know what? I really don't have one. I bought this um, as a speculator and I set a sell <laughs> order when it went 10% up and I actually haven't looked at it whether it's gone up 10% enough yet or not. Uh, so I like Baidu as an AI play, uh, but I thought the valuations were a little bit lofty up here at the 350 range when I last looked at it. Um, if you like, uh, come over to the, the Discord guys and, and we'll do some polls on some more discounted cash flow price models and I can certainly do some things for some other Chinese stocks like Baidu, etc. Um, Uh, Robert is saying, that's a very good point, Robert. You are always insightful. With EVs, a lot of people simply won't drive to petrol stations ever again because they will be able to charge in their home um, if they certainly in the US where a lot of people live in standalone houses, they can simply charge at home. So they'll never ever go to a petrol station again. Why would they? And so you will actually probably see you're right. Um, petrol stations will be perhaps for hydrogen, for trucks uh, and um there will perhaps be less petrol stations, in which case they will rely. Yeah, but the business is going to be even worse than it is right now, right? I think that's kind of kind of the point. Eventually, there will be a glut of charging stations because you will just all have them all at home. Um, H I M S. Uh, someone's shouting out here. Uh, Ali, and not so, sorry. Apologies for calling you someone. Ims and hers health. I don't really know anything about this company fundamentally, um, to, to be honest with you. It is all I can see here. There is support at 11.30 and perhaps a little bit. Yeah, that's kind of the real support. Perhaps a little bit at 11.87. We got a sell signal here on the 25th of March um, and it's sort of bobbing sideways without any particular direction or volume. So I, I wouldn't see that there is any particularly positive momentum in that unless they announce some, some real news or something like that. Um, will the recharging stations have enough supply in apartment complexes, says Andrew there? Uh, so yeah, I think there will be a difference. So if you live in Manhattan, say, uh, there will be charging stations. Um, petrol stations will be still very much required. Uh, and perhaps you're going to get battery swappings in places like that as well, because it might make sense. In the long run, I do think that anybody with a car park will have charging. Uh, and if you look at in, in Europe, for example, where you have in, by the side of the road, they're putting up charging stations. So just like there used to be a, a meter where you had to pay for parking, there is now a charging station. And, and so you just park anywhere, basically outside your home. And not quite anywhere yet, but, you know, there will be quite a few that will allow you to charge. So I just think that infrastructure will come. Um, uh, but yes, Andrew, you are right. There is an issue in places where people live in more condensed housing, if you will. Um, uh, Ken, okay, you're putting in solar panels. That's very interesting. Uh, that's uh, good of you. And probably also tax efficient, I imagine, right? Um, a few people own cars in Manhattan, I think, uh, Robert. Uh, true, Robert. Uh, that is a point. Uh, it's a valid point. Um, I suppose you are relying more on car services and taxis there. And for them, you will need stations somewhere or perhaps battery swapping will be the smart thing to do for taxis at the moment. Um, I suppose, OK, LA might be the better example. It's fairly high density, but still a, quite a lot of people live in, in standalone houses, but not everybody. You still have condominium complexes. Um, so perhaps there is more of an issue. But yeah, the, okay, the US, fair enough. The US has a lot of space, right? You, you guys just have a lot of space. You probably don't need to worry about this too much. It's more of an issue in, in, in China, perhaps, where, uh, say, in Shanghai, people are fairly affluent. They were very affluent. A lot of people have cars, but most people will live in, uh, in condominiums, in high-rise buildings with perhaps 40, 50, 60 stories. Uh, so that then creates a, a need for either uh, you all put in battery 
Uh, so there's charging stations on the underground car parks. And in the new buildings, that's what you're starting to see. Not for every car park, but for quite a lot of them. And I suppose that way, as they get more intelligent, they could actually just rotate through that, right? You drive, you don't need a charger on every parking spot. It's actually inefficient. Uh, say if you have 10% uh, that have it and the cars will just uh, rotate themselves using autonomous driving, you just book in and say, please charge tonight. And then there'll be a queue and then it, by the morning, everybody will be charged. So I think uh, something like that will be uh, the future, I think. Um, uh, Pierce says Starlink. Yes, that is an exciting uh, part of, of, of uh, Tesla, of course. And that is not something any other EV company has here. So Tesla is not just an EV company. We sometimes forget that. Um, uh, uh, RAW, do you invest in metals that go into car batteries? Yes, absolutely. I think it is probably the most promising and exciting investment opportunity uh, at present. Uh, we have a huge research channel on that here. Uh, it's called our EV raw material channel, which uh, Robert pretty much writes uh, single-handedly. Um, and for example, I put in the search here MP materials here, and you see that here on the right, that's all the research coming up on MP uh, materials. So it, it is a lot more in depth than I think what you see in a lot of Discord channels where people just carry shouting, buy, buy, buy. Uh, so yes, huge amounts and really, I would say a huge word of caution because you need to understand the mining process. You need to understand the raw materials. You need to understand a little bit the chemistry of what they're getting out of the ground, where they're getting out of the ground. Is it a proven technology? Is it not? Um, and um, just because it says lithium in the name, uh, it doesn't mean it's a good investment. For example, LAC uh, to me sounds a bit like a dud, uh, yet lots of people are throwing money at it. Um, Robert is saying many people buy the Rivians. Okay. F Carlin, uh, great to have you on here. 1,437 shares near to the moon. I always like your enthusiasm. Um, um, Abo is asking for a lower priced uh, tiers on the Patreon. I, I don't know if we're going to do that again, uh, Abo. I, I kind of want to keep it fairly small and uh, boutique uh, so that we don't just sort of get like memes being thrown at the, at the channel, uh, but rather we get lots of people who are uh, doing lots of research. And I think people are getting good value. I mean, I think I look at some of the uh, testimonials I put up actually today. Uh, people are really excited about it. People are, I feel like they're getting a, a good community and good research and good resources and good people to bounce things off. So um, at the moment, that's the direction I'm going in. But uh, watch this space. Uh, Ken says you have green incentives from the government. OK. Um, uh, Andrew says raw material should be renamed Robert Lidfield. Uh, absolutely. We should do that. It's perhaps not the catchiest name, is it? EV raw materials. I think we might want to rename that to something more uh, catchy. Um, mini stock market picks here. Welcome. You're saying, can the EVs act like mini satellite dishes? They are nodes, your thoughts. So you think you connect them and you use them as some sort of communication network. You could get rid of all the mobile phone masts, in theory. You'd have a problem, though, at four in the morning, wouldn't you, uh, when everyone's at home and all the uh, Teslas are parked in their garages, tucked in nicely charging. Um, but yeah, there might be other applications. You are right. You have an, you have an, have an intelligent network with lots of computing power. It's highly connected through uh, high-speed connections. Uh, there are probably uh, other things we could do with that. I think you are quite right. It's just we haven't quite figured out what yet. Um, uh, and what is your $92 uh, price target based? Uh, Gabriel, I went through in rather great detail in this discounted cash flow model. And I, what I recommend, I don't normally say that, Either jump to the beginning of this or, or wait a little bit. I'll put out a summary video of, of, of exactly me running through this um, later today. So you can just watch out for that. Just turn on your, your, your subscribe button to the channel, which you guys should all do. Look, look at my, my subscribe. Uh, um, look what I made. This is my efforts today at Arts and Crafts. Subscribe. Uh, so yeah, maybe just, just do that. I'm not going to run you through the whole thing again here at the moment because it takes a bit of time. Uh, but uh, it's essentially a um, discounted cash flow model here. And you can see my, my growths and all the stuff. And again, of course, uh, this document 
is shared with you guys over on the Patreon. You can play with it. How do you do it? Uh, click on file, make a copy, and then it's all yours. Or you can download it into an Excel file if you prefer. Um, and then you can, you can mess with it to your heart's content. All the formulas will still work. Um, Uh, Ma Long Fun, you're getting a German Shepherd puppy in two weeks. I named him Neo. Okay, that's fantastic. That's very sweet. With German Shepherds, I'm German. Uh, word of, uh, of, uh, of advice, I don't normally advise for German Shepherds. Really uh, do some serious dog training there. You don't have to be tough or harsh with them, but you have to be the master. You have to be the dominant alpha male. If you are not, your dog will be utterly miserable. And I live here in Hong Kong. Lots of our neighbors have uh, uh, German Shepherds, beautiful dogs. It are not exercised and no one is in control. So the dogs are basically terrified, anxious all the time because they have to protect everybody. Uh, so German Shepherds are amazing, beautiful, intelligent beings. And they need lots of stimulation, lots of exercise, and they need to be someone who is continuously dominant. So watch some Caesar Milan or something like that or, or find yourself a dog trainer who doesn't bring out choking collars and, and electrocution and this sort of jibber. They're just someone who understands that you just need to be the boss, basically. Um, Ken says, my name, son is named Neo. I win. Well, in that case, you might want to look at uh, a certain rare earth play called Neo in Europe. Um, <laughs> yes, Robert saying after Neo performance. Okay, that's another one. Look at Tesla, satellite, stationary receivers, transmitters, and they add their car. Something is going to happen in the future we don't know about. Um, yeah, I think it's a potential. I think it's true. Say you have 10 million roads, cars on the road in the US, and they're all somehow linked up. Um, that becomes quite a powerful network. I don't know what you'll do with it. Or maybe you mine Bitcoin at night <laughs> or something like that. I mean, there's certainly something you could do with that. Um, uh, when is this price target, uh, Gabriel, a uh, year end? For me, this is a, 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 a end of year price target. Uh, it's not sort of a in 20 years time price target. For me, it's a, it's a year end. Um, next channel, hashtag dogs. Um, you knew, uh, Felix knows about training German Shepherds as well, Andrew. Um, I, have a, I have a rescue a golden retriever who's the loveliest, sweetest being. Uh, but even with him, you need to be, you know, you need to be in charge. And when people are not that sort of a little bit dominating in, in, in a nice way, um, then he feels also nervous because then he has to protect you, right? Then he starts barking at other dogs. Uh, when he's with me, he doesn't because I am fairly disciplined in a way. I'm super gentle and kind to him, but um, it's important that, you know, it's, it's the little things like you don't step over him because if you were the alpha dog on a pack, the other dogs would move for you. So all you have to do is go, excuse me, and then he moves. Uh, and he doesn't mind. He might grunt a little. But, you know, little things like that basically make you dominant. Uh, so watch some Caesar Milan if you get a puppy. Um, the, the man is, is, is full of uh, lots of wisdom. Um, uh, Husasa, thank you for sharing the Andrew T. Yeah, wait 10 years. Um, what do you think about GIQ? Is someone turning out? We can have a quick look at that. I always step over my dog, Andrew. Um, every time you do that, you lose a point, basically, and he becomes a little bit more important than you. Um, and, okay, if you have a small poodle or something and you just sort of play around in the house with it, perhaps it's fine, but the reason you see dogs barking in the street is because they're anxious and they're defending their owners. When the dog walks ahead of you, he, he's saying, I'm your boss. So little things like that um, make a huge difference, and you just have to be a little bit pedantic with it at the beginning, tell them about a thousand times and reward them for doing the right thing. And then they're super happy uh, and, and they just are more, I think, well-rounded, calmer, friendlier, happier. And that's really what you want in a dog, right? The alpha male is anxious because he has to protect the pack. Uh, whereas you kind of want your dog to be the B guy and you to be the A guy and then, you know, your dog can chill out. So um, seriously, watch some, some Caesar Milan. Um, it's probably all on, on Netflix uh, and you just kind of pick that up or... Uh, you can get a get a dog trainer that sort of follows something similar, and I, th I think it's seriously worth doing, especially when you have a young young dog. Um, and we're now talking about dogs. Maybe we should do a dog channel, right? Should we do a dog channel, guys? I'll just start talking about fluffy uh, dogs all the time. I think I quite enjoy that. Um, uh, also for hunting dogs, Bob, uh, absolutely for all dogs, basically. Um, the more dominant your dog is sort of genetically, and a German Shepherd is much more dominant than, say, a Golden Retriever because he just wants to please, right? And he wants to get food. And much easier to train, in a sense. The more dominant your dog is, the more important it is. 
but it's still important for every fluffy uh, small creature, whether it's a, it's a lap dog or a chihuahua or, or anything. You just give them a sense of comfort if they know, well, you know, Andrew is in charge. I can sleep, I can rest, he'll protect me, he knows what to do. If Andrew isn't in charge, then I need to protect Andrew. And that's kind of the psychology there here. Um, Robert's saying, take your wife and dog and toss them into the trunk of your car and drive for an hour and you will know who truly loves you. <laughs> Robert, are you, are you single by any chance? <laughs> or perhaps on a wanted list somewhere? <laughs> Uh, I think you have a beagle. They're also beautiful dogs. Absolutely lovely. A little bit stubborn at times, but fantastic. Um, you think I, I, I should make a dog channel? Absolutely. Um, am I watching the right channel, Oriental? Well, we've become the um, the um, a financial dog channel here for some reason. Over right, we're decent. Rich bag. They're also absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. Um, and he's a, he's a better to you. Uh, and that's super uh, fantastic. Well done there, Richard. Um, it's uh, fantastic. You thought this was about Neo Oriental. You're obviously on the wrong channel. Uh, we just talk about dogs here. No, it is about Neo, guys. Um, <laughs> um, Robert has a, has a funny sense of humor. Uh, well, throw out stuff you want me to look at. Uh, any questions you have Neo related, uh, I will get to that and I'll stop talking about dogs. Although, uh, given that there are 185 of us on this chat here, people don't seem to mind uh, too much. Um, so I can do a quick recap here. I've done a 10 year um, discount on cash flow model. Um, I haven't, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, put in car growth numbers here that, that are insane. For this year, 148%, that's about uh, where most uh, analysts are and that's what we are doing. Uh, Q1 was up 420%, so bear that in mind, right? So for the full year, 148%, I think seems quite reasonable. And then I'm slowing that down here a little bit. Uh, and then actually after 2025, I'm basically putting in very, very little 10 to 5% growth there. Why? Uh, because I see a little bit of a wall there with, we are going to have to find new markets. We are have to, going to have to come up with new models to sell more cars uh, to get up to a sort of BMW type level. Possible, but I haven't priced it in. If you um, do uh, add that in, you know, you say rather than this being 5 or 10%, you make that all 10%, uh, then that would, of course, um, add, say, $12. So each 5% increment here, so it would add $10, $12 to the valuation up there. Um, I'm putting in a bit of margins here that are, I think, pretty conservative, and we go up to 15%, which is where Tesla is right now. So again, I think fairly conservative numbers. And then I've thrown in here in yellow autonomous driving revenue with a 50% margin, and I'm basing that on, um, well, Microsoft has pretty much that margin. Um, Amazon's cloud business has that margin. I think a software business should have that margin. Otherwise, they're doing something wrong and adding that on top. And that's pretty much it. The multiplier I'm using by the end of the period is 10.5x. At the moment, the NASDAQ average, 17.8x. So again, I'm using a conservative number. So I think I want to arrive at a fair value. I don't want to arrive at a crazy value. Um, if you want to be more bullish on this, um, you could fairly easily get to $150 or so. But I think that will take a bit more foresight. It will take us a little bit further down the road and not to the end of the year, which is what I was aiming for here as well. Um, Ken says, does that apply to my son as well? You mean the throwing him in the boot part or the, the dominating part? Well, actually, children are very much like dogs, I think. Um, have you heard the rumor of Apple and VW? Have I heard the rumor of Apple and everybody? Um, there are rumors of Apple with every single car manufacturer or every single person who's ever owned a car, <laughs> I would say. Uh, so is there anything to it? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we have had so many rumors there uh, until something is actually announced. Uh, I, I don't really know. Um, uh, Dixon says, will over 10-year DCF always have higher valuations than a five-year DCF if the expected growth rate is higher than the terminal growth rate? Um, interesting question, Dixon. No, just because you make the time period longer doesn't mean you get a higher value because you're discounting it back. Um, I have quite purposefully, after 2025, uh, taken my growth out of car sales here because to me that's the risk is will they grow this successfully around the world will they launch more suvs more you know seven seaters more smaller cars more sort of minis uh, will they be able to conquer a a, a sort of um, breadth of, of 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 cars say like mercedes is or, or bmw is in which case yes they could actually sell more cars like this but i'm not taking it into account here um the 
discounting back. Um, let me see, does it show that on here? Um, somewhere in here. It, it, it does sort of, you know, it, it isn't just because I got the numbers up here to 2030. That's why I get us to a higher number necessarily. The reason I put it out 10 years and for some growth stocks, it makes sense because for me, NEO and all EVs are not about cars. I'm not interested in investing in cars at all. No interest whatsoever. It's a terrible business. I'm interested in investing in the subscription revenue, the autonomous driving revenue. Uh, and you can see here that's, that's accounting to for about a third of profits uh, by, um, by, by 2030 on this particular model. Now, there are opportunities, I think, for them to make more money on subscription revenue, but I'm not counting that in here because I want to be a bit conservative. But that's really why I've done that. Whereas if I stop at 2025, um, I get, um, you know, only, what is that, 12, 20% or so, uh, or 15% of, of, of profits, uh, like 20% or so of profits coming from, and a relatively small amount of coming from ADR. Because why? But you need to have the legislation in place and you need to have sufficient number of cars on the road that are equipped for autonomous driving, and that takes a bit of time. Um, Neo has not emailed me back about Inceptio, uh, Voltron. No, I'm afraid they have not. Um, uh, Neo is a puppy right now, says Malong Fang. Uh, that's pretty much what, uh, what William Lee says, right? He says he's a toddler. Um, topic for another day, perhaps. How's Tesla and Neo going to repair broken EVs? I read somewhere that a, pl a plan is to have someone show up at your home and return the EV when repaired. Uh, well, Robert, I think what would be even better is that your EV drives itself to the repair station. Of course, if it can no longer drive because you, uh, you know, knocked off uh, uh, a few wheels, you know, throwing your, your wife in the boot, uh, then, yeah, there will be a service. I think, I think very much so. Well, we have that new already, right? The van comes to you. It, it does the repairs. It can take it away. Um, they have that service already. Uh, so that's probably not unique to NEO, but they will also bring you a, a vehicle to in, in, in exchange. And that depends on what NEO insurance plan you're on. And that's, of course, another thing we're not talking about here in our numbers is NEO insurance. Um, oh, sending him to the kennel, Ken. I don't recommend sending dogs to kennels. I also don't recommend sending dogs to get them trained because you know who needs to be trained? It's you, the owner. It's not the dog. Uh, the dog already knows everything. It's you who needs to be trained. Um, Neo with 100,000 uh, 100, US dollar minivans in 2022, says Piers. Um, that's a possibility. Yes, that would be perhaps additional to my, my, my revenue here. Um, uh, Jose, uh, thank you very much. You're sharing that they're also about exactly the pickup service. Neo, Neo already has that. Neo is all about service. If they can do service, they'll do it. And um, the kind of customers that uh, buy NEOs are fairly affluent. They love that. Uh, service is exactly what they want. Um, how bullish are you on NEO on a scale of 1 to, uh, to, to, to 10? Uh, and, uh, 92 at present. Um, maybe make that a scale out of 100. Uh, maybe NEO will uh, partner with, uh, with ChargePoint to add battery swapping in the US. Possible. They're basically outsourced it. I mean, that's what we know. They are, they are outsourcing it to somebody. Uh, if you look at the, the hirings for Neo Norway, it gives you kind of an insight of how they set things up. And they're basically saying, yes, we have, we're hiring certain engineers and mechanics. And what's your job? Well, your job is to kind of find an external technician, electrician, you can install the, the, the charge points and kits. It's for you to find third parties that will build the charging station. So yeah, they outsource it to somebody is there loads of money in that? In the margins, I kind of doubt it. I think it'll become a rather competitive space. Um, uh, Bob Prague, I'm glad you agree with me. It is important to train the dog owner, not the dog. And that includes everybody in the family who handles the dog. Um, any updates on when Neo is going to enter Norway? I understand their sovereign fund has bought in quite a substantial amount of shares. Yes, they have, which is funny because it's all oil money, isn't it? But that is the world's largest investor. Uh, they own, what was the number? I think two or three percent of all the shares in the world are owned by this Norwegian wealth fund. It's absolutely staggering what oil money can do. Um, we haven't got much more of a timeline. It's definitely Q, um, well, it's definitely 2021. Uh, I posted, I think it was, was it yesterday? 
uh, more job ads up in, in Norway. So they are obviously actively recruiting here. Um, no, not that one. I think it might have been this one. Yeah, this was out. When did I post this? Uh, on the second. So two days ago, they were added some new, additional um, job adverts here. They're looking for sales advisors, automotive technicians, new house specialists. Um, I don't think you would hire those guys out nine months ahead or 12 months ahead. It seems a bit silly on, on, on a spend. So I think the fact that they're hiring salespeople and, and people to run near your house it means we are, we, are, we are fairly closer than we think. Um, every bit of news I get on that, guys, you'll be the first to know. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button. And I, and I follow lots of things that can give us insights. Also, some of our members who are in, in Norway and Sweden share things, insights with us on the Discord here, which is fantastic. Um, are there any straight electricity plays, Richard? Well, utilities will actually do relatively well out of this, yes. Uh, Felix, so calm, you know, I, I don't quite understand your question. If you uh, add a few more words to it, I might. Uh, Holy thinks the stock is going to get delisted. Uh, I, I, I uh, disagree with you on that, Holy Bananas, uh, as much as I like your name on Holy Easter Sunday. I, I disagree with you on that. I, I don't think these kind of commercial companies are going to get delisted. Um, Andrew T, this guy, uh, uh, no worries. We can all, uh, well, some people have different opinions and some people also come to live chats just to tease people and get a bit of a reaction. So uh, I'm not going to give you that benefit here. Um, guys, you have any other questions? Now is the time to shout them out. Um, Okay, uh, Robert is saying, have a look at Nextera. Uh, no greater moat than electric companies and other utilities. True, try building a utility network from, from scratch. Um, uh, that is, uh, is quite a difficult thing to do. Uh, you know what probably has a similar moat, uh, Robert? Tobacco. <laughs> Not as popular as an investment, uh, but uh, try launching a cigarette brand. Uh, you can't because you can't advertise it. Um, uh, get him out of here, says Ken, uh, smiley well. I mean, you know, he, we can have some fun. Um, uh, okay, I'm glad you investigated in, in Neo. Uh, I don't think it's getting it delisted. Um, 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 yes, I actually agree with you on that. We should, we should learn to be uh, amenable to opposing views, even if we disagree with them strongly. Um, What's my end of a uh, trade on Monday? Uh, uh, Rob, I haven't got a, a, a magic ball yet to give you an exact number. Um, uh, play back a little bit to my um, technical analysis. I'll also put out some technical analysis later today, and I'll also put out a complete run through again of my uh, neo technical uh, discounted cash flow guys here. So uh, do check that out. Uh, make sure you come over to the Discord, guys. It's a fantastic community. Um, you will learn a lot. You'll have lots and lots of insight and you can talk to me and you can talk to Robert, who is probably more insightful uh, than, than, than I am. Um, and 130 out of 163 watching, press the like button, Robert. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, of course, it's not quite how it works. Uh, about three and a half thousand people have come and gone through the live chat at the moment. I can see here uh, people stick around at the moment for an average of about five or six minutes. And that's about uh, the average attention span of your, your, your YouTuber. So uh, thank you for everybody who's sticking around longer than that. Um, Crystal Ball is coming soon. Absolutely. I might be able to afford it soon when you guys hit the like and subscribe button at the moment. Uh, I'm working in rather low tech here uh, to encourage you to subscribe. <laughs> um, uh, guys, it's going to be a wrap here from me. I really appreciate you all tuning in on Easter Sunday. Uh, think of a fluffy creatures. Hit that like button for them and I'll keep donating. Um, so we get our donations up for the month, hopefully to $500 or more. Um, thank you very much for everybody who's subscribing. Uh, love you guys for building this community and come and hop over to the Discord. It is a fantastic place. You can ask me questions and you can see all of our marvelous research and everything else. Uh, so thank you very much um, and have a beautiful Easter Sunday. Thanks for tuning in.